got a patient that's been responsive. He's got a hole in his chest. We put a chest seal on that. We'll take this and we're gonna take it out. So we've got a tourniquet in place. All we gotta do is tighten it back down, okay? Okay, respirations. Respirations are breathing. We have to take care of breathing. <clears throat> when we have a bullet hole in the chest area, these lungs that are in the chest are inflated because of a vacuum around the lung. So the lung is in there. It can compress down pretty small, but there's a vacuum around it that has a seal, and that vacuum between the chest wall and that lung helps hold that lung open. If you puncture that, pew, it allows air to come in that cavity. You lose that vacuum and that lung collapses. If we take a chest seal and we put a chest seal on here, as they breathe in, it opens that chest wall and it pulls that lung inflated a little bit. And then as they breathe out, that air needs to go somewhere, which is why we want a vented chest seal. That air can escape a little bit. And over time, as they breathe, every time it opens up a little bit more. And then we put a uh, chest seal on there and it covers it up. And um, that vent will allow the air to come out, but not to go back in. If there's a hole here, big hole here, and their trachea is the size of your pinky. So your trachea is about the size of your pinky. If there's a hole here that has a lot of resistance and it's the size of your pinky, and we've got a hole here that's that big, path of least resistance, where do you think the air is gonna go when he takes a breath in? Right here, it's not going into the lungs, it's going into the bullet hole that's here. We put a seal on that and he takes a breath in, now it's going into the lungs, right? So that's one reason is so the air goes in the right spot. The second is so that we can help reinflate that lung after the fact, okay? So neck to navel, we're gonna throw a chest seal. Now that is on the side, on the front, on the back. If you have a shot here, be thinking about an exit wound and bullets don't usually go all the way through. They tumble some, so it may be lower on the back. You don't know what angle it came in, all that. So just make sure you do a good assessment of this patient and you've taken care of any penetrating trauma in the core. Throw a chest seal on. Is chest seal gonna help bleeding? No. no, it's just for respirations, right? That's why we're in R, okay? Then, if we have a patient that's not breathing, this is where we bring our BVM in. We can breathe for him. We're not gonna really go into that right now, but that's where we can start assisting his ventilations here in our respirations phase. You have to be careful though, because when you start pushing air into here and you've got a ruptured lung, you can end up with a bunch of pressure in there. So these are vented chest seals. So when you open them up, you notice they have vents in here. So when we put them on, see that circle in the middle? Circle goes over the area of injury. This gel sticks to it, and now we have three vents. These vents can let blood and air out of that wound. So if there's blood in that cavity that leaks out, it can come out. If there's air in there, it can expel that air so it doesn't end up causing a tension pneumo in the side of the chest. But when they take a breath in, this is gonna collapse against that wound and it's gonna keep air from coming in. So we want air to be able to get out, but not in. So that's why I'll use vented seals. Let's say I don't have a vented seal. I use this plastic. I take this, I take some tape and I tape it on there. If I tape it on all sides, about every 10, 15 minutes, I'm gonna to have to reassess and make sure that we haven't trapped a bunch of air in there. If we have, and he's starting to uh, have significant chest pain and decreased lung sounds on one side, and, I wanna take this and I wanna peel it back and I wanna let some of that air out. That's called burping the seal. We're gonna peel some of that back, let that air out, put it back into place. Now, one way we can start to combat that a little bit is I can make this a valve by taping here, here, and here on three sides, but one side's still open. So if there's significant pressure buildup, it can ventilate out one side, but if he takes a breath in, it's gonna collapse against that and hold pressure. Does that make sense? So we just kind of made our own vented chest seal by taping on three sides. Now you gotta be careful because if I tape on three sides like this, there's a hole there. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna do what it needs to. So we need to make sure that it's in place and then we're gonna tape on three sides. Typically, that side we leave off is gonna be the downhill side. So if blood comes out, that blood can leave. If we do it here and it's open, that blood's gonna pull in there and clot in there and that's not gonna help it uh, vent very well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you only do a vented on one of the holes? So typically if he's on his back, it's not gonna vent anyway. So if, I, if all I have is vented chest seals, yeah, just throw vented chest seals wherever, that's fine. If I have plastic packaging and I've got a hole here and a hole out the other side, I'm gonna put my vent on the top because it's, not a, it's exposed, so it should be able to vent fine. When I roll him over and there's a hole on the back, 
I'm just gonna tape it on all four sides. That way I don't have to worry about it opening and coming off and that kind of thing. I want this pretty secure. We can vent through the top. So I know I've got a vent somewhere. Okay. Um, but you do need to kind of treat each side separately. So if he's got a bullet hole here and then a separate injury over here, I probably want this one vented because it's it may not be um, working the same way as this. Does that make sense? So on the opposite side of the chest, I'm probably gonna want to vent on the other side as well. So preferred is vented on everything. If it's on the same lung, it doesn't necessarily Correct. Correct. Preferred vented everywhere. If you don't have it, then at least make sure one of your holes is on that side is vented. Does that make sense? If not, if all you have is plastic, tape it and just reassess that guy every 10 to 15 minutes and peel it back and let some of that air out. They also come with gauze in here. What is this for? So dry it off so it sticks well. That's really what it is. So these will be in each packet. So take one of these bad boys, dry it off, slap it on. So if you're at the mall somewhere and they've got the little AD signs and there's AD and someone gets shot in the chest, you can pull the AD pad and use it. Um, those AD pads are much more expensive than these. These are like 12 bucks for a set of two. The AD pads are, I don't know, 50, 60 bucks for the cheap ones. But if that's all you have, they work great and they're big. So you can slap one of those on there and it covers a large area. So yeah. Respirations, we're gonna do chest seals neck to navel. Make sure you check all the way around. Possible BVM, but you have to be careful with that BVM because you're gonna be forcing air down in one of these possibly collapsed lungs. So we have to be really careful with pressure and make sure we have a vented chest seal and then we're checking that, okay? So you've got a patient that's been responsive. He's had a hole in his chest. We put a chest seal on that. We notice 10 minutes later, he's really lethargic and not really talking to us. What's the first thing we wanna check? chest seal, let's pull it back and uh, see, if, see if that helps um, and reinflate that lung. That may not do it. He may have lost enough blood. It may be something else, but we do want to check that, okay? Circulation. When we're going over circulation, we've already done massive hemorrhage, which is related to circulation. Now we're talking about blood circulation. We're kind of going a step further than we did in the original March algorithm or the M. So when we're doing this, there's a couple things we're doing. One, we're gonna look at pelvic binders and we're gonna talk about improvised and commercial pelvic binders in a minute. We're gonna be talking about reassessing tourniquets. So I got a tourniquet on there, I go check it, I wanna make sure it's tight. I also may have a severe injury here. They put a tourniquet on high and tight, it's doing its job, but I may want to reposition that closer down. So we reposition tourniquets. We can also downgrade a tourniquet to wound packing. We convert that to wound packing. So let's say there's some severe bleeding, lower arm, Direct threat care, we throw a tourniquet on, we pull them out, we get them to a safe spot, and we're doing further care on them. And we go, there's a good bit of bleeding here, but I think we can wound pack that and stop it. Well, if I wound pack that area, that keeps circulation of the rest of the arm and gives him a better chance for having most use of his arm, especially if it's gonna be over two hours before he gets the surgery, okay? So that's where we're gonna convert a tourniquet. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Reassessing tourniquet, converting it if we need, or moving the tourniquet closer down to that area if it's gonna be longer than two hours before he gets to care. So pelvic binder, checking tourniquets, moving them down. This is also the point where typically you would start IVs, get fluids, blood transfusion, all that kind of stuff in our circulation care. Um, but we're not doing that here. So we're doing any other further wound packing, blood um, circulation, keep the blood inside the body. Venous bleeding from veins, not, not arteries, but venous bleeding can become an issue. You can lose enough blood through a vein that it becomes an issue. So we wanna take care of those right now too. So we wanna stop all bleeding, keep that inside the body, convert stuff so it's all optimum. And we're kind of rechecking everything circulation wise that we've been through. Converting a tourniquet. <clears throat> okay, so we have a uh, through and through gunshot wound, arterial bleeding. We put a tourniquet on and now we're gonna convert that over. He's got an extended time till surgery. So we wanna go ahead and pack this. So I'm gonna take my uh, wound packing gauze I'm gonna do like anything else, find the area of bleed, direct pressure, pack it in here. And I'm gonna fill this void, pack it in there tight, put this in place, and now I'm gonna wrap pressure on it. Get done and I'll secure that clip. Okay, so we've got it wound packed, this is still in place. Now what we're gonna do is we'll take this and we're gonna take it out and we're gonna slowly let pressure off. And as we let pressure off now, we're gonna be monitoring this to make sure it doesn't just start pouring blood. Once we think we're good, like, okay, we're good, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna reset this two to three inches above the wound. We're gonna put it in place. We're not gonna tighten it down, but I'm just gonna set it here and leave it in place. That way, if something ruptures and something goes south here, I've still got a tourniquet in place. All we gotta do is tighten it back down, okay? So if we've got an amputation of a hand and we've got a tourniquet high and tight, when we go, we can move that tourniquet. 
So rather than a through and through, let's say it's a full hand amputation. We can't wound pack an amputation. So all we would do on this would be, instead of this wound packing, this tourniquet would be in place. We'd come put a second tourniquet on down here, two to three inches above the wound, tighten it down, do all that fun stuff with the tourniquet, put it in place, secure it. And then we would release this one slowly to make sure this one's holding, and then we could take this one off. And now we've converted, well, we haven't converted, we're still using a tourniquet, but we have moved it. We've relocated the tourniquet down two to three inches above the wound. That way we're at least getting some perfusion to the rest of this. Now, if you've had a tourniquet in place for more than two hours, um, if it's already been there for over two hours, don't go back and take it back off. Um, because at that point you have enough lactic acid and everything built up in there that now you could have further complications um, from that. That it's acid, if it's, been at, if it's been two hours, all that acid build up and everything in there, when it comes, it's gonna go through circulation, it's gonna hit the heart and it can cause arrhythmias in the heart and you can end up killing the patient. If it's been in place for over two hours already, don't convert it or don't move it, just leave it in place and, and they need to be at a hospital or somewhere when that uh, tourniquet gets removed. Does that make sense? We just did a uh, video on YouTube for our um, pelvic binders and improvised pelvic binders. So that will give you a lot more. We have some anatomy scans and stuff to show all that kind of stuff. So you can see like some anatomy of where this stuff goes. It's hard for me to actually show you a pelvis right now. Um, so we will put one on, but if we have a a uh, patient that has sustained significant injury, we think they may have a pelvic fracture. We want to stabilize that in place so it's not getting manipulated and moved around. Um, and we're going to do that with a, either a commercial pelvic binder, like the pelvic sling from Sam, or we can improvise one, um, which we'll show in a minute. So let's throw this pelvic binder on first. Um, who wants to be a patient? When we're putting this on, we're going to use natural voids, which is either small of the back or the knees. So let's slide it up under his knees. Let's work it up. Um, on them. When we put this on, we're putting this on the top of the uh, top of the femur is really where it's going. So it's the bottom of the pelvis. So you have your hip bone up here. If we push on that, it's actually going to open the bottom of the pelvis more. So we want to go on the bottom of the pelvis, which is the bony prominence toward the top of the femur. So look, th this is his hip bone on the top. We don't want to go there. We want to go down here. So it's really going to go down and push on the bottom part. So if we put one of these on someone that doesn't need one, we're not gonna do any damage. So if we suspect any type of pelvic injury, we're gonna put one on. If they're going into shock, if they have severe amputations, if they have uh, sustained a significant, like they fell 15 foot off a roof doing framing, there's a chance they could have a pelvic fracture. So we're gonna go ahead and put one on. And what exactly is it doing? Holding, the pelvis? holding everything, it's splinting it. It's holding everything together so those bones don't move, which when those bo bones move and hit, nerves and arteries, it can cause increased bleeding and severe pain. So we're holding that in place to keep any further bleeding from happening. Feel pretty comfortable? Nope. Just slide it all, slide it all the way through, just like a tourniquet. Pull it back and pull it till it clicks. So you're gonna pull this and this, and you're gonna go till it clicks. It just clicked. So you didn't, so try it again. There you go. It clicked, push this on. These, when pressure is released, those little pins will pop back in there. That's fine. The pins are not meant to hold it. The Velcro holds it. Those pins just keep you from over tightening it. Okay. And it tells you how tight to go. So you go until it clicks, secure the Velcro. And again, just like tourniquets, you want to make sure that's pretty secure. Otherwise, you lose your pelvic binder. Sure. Okay. Once we do this to a patient, we want to put them on a spine board or some sort of litter. Because if we stabilize that, but their legs are flopping everywhere, <laughs> It's not doing you any good. You're still gonna start manipulating that. Because remember, where we're pushing is the top of the femur. The femur's this bone. We put that on and then we drag them and the femur goes this way, we just mess that up. Like we're not um, doing anything to help them. So we wanna put them on a spine board. If we can't put them on a spine board, we put them on some sort of litter. And you can even tie their legs together so they all stay straight. We wanna keep that patient as straight as possible once we have that in place. Does that make sense? Okay, Jed, why don't you lay down? This is a uh, rise. Splint by Tactical Medical Solutions. You can use it in place of a SAM splint. It folds up. You use these little, like that, and then it makes a little L-shaped bracket. You can fold these over like a SAM splint, secure them in place. They all fold up. I don't like them for splinting. I much prefer a SAM splint. The one thing about these, though, is they have little grooves in them. So we're going to wrap this around. We're going to stick a tourniquet in here, and we're going to use this as a binder and use that tourniquet to hold it together. We can do the same thing with a SAM splint. Just use trauma shears or a knife, cut you a hole in there, pull it through. You just wanna make sure you don't get too close to the edges because when you put pressure, it may tear the rest of the way. 
um, and you don't want to get too close to the edge. You want to make sure you have a hold here. So grab one of those and a tourniquet of your choice and let's stabilize Jed. So push that through and pull it all the way through to the hub. So pull it all the way through the hub because you want maximum amount of space here. So I would pull it all the way down to somewhere like that. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Clip it in place, pull it tight. And we're not putting these on as tight as we are tourniquets. We're not trying to occlude anything. We're just stabilizing. We're holding this in place. Hey, we're learning here though, right? We're like, okay, this doesn't work very well for this. So if you only got one tourniquet and you want it to be multi-purpose, then maybe this is not the one for you. So I think this is a bit higher than it needs to be. We're probably just come down a little bit more. Just, yeah, we probably need to be right there. But you, you don't have to fix it for this one. But just know, yeah. everyone feel on yourself. Like you should be able to feel a bony prominence about here, which is well below belt line. And that's what we're pushing for. If you come up to the hip bone, which is up here, that's not what we're pushing for. If we push these together, it's actually going to pull the bottom apart because they're like wings pelvic wings and when we push on the top it actually pulls the bottom you're going to pivot it so we want to push on the bottom and hold the bottom together does that make sense yep. so here you go sam you're at the construction site and something happens someone falls a significant way you got a sam splint in your kit you have a tourniquet so now you can improvise and come up with something based on minimal equipment that you already have yep. without having to have a 80 dollars. i think that's 80 dollars for that sling yeah bring it back over pull yeah just pull all the way through Yep, there you go. I would pull it all the way through to the hub, and then if it ends up being, and this is where, yeah, when you put it on him, you're not gonna have a whole lot of Velcro. Go ahead and pull it through. Whoop. <laughs> so use, use the rise one. So yeah, and this is a perfect example. Like, I'm glad that happened. So it, we've done this several times, so it's starting to weaken it. And if you do it over and over, it, it's metal, right? It'll start to get that crease in there and weaken it. But two, we don't need to go super tight on these. We're just stabilizing in place, right? Oh, that's interesting. So you'd have to shift this over, yeah. right? That's why you pull this side all the way to the hub. And yeah, I think position on that looks good. It's right up here. Should be right up there on the top of the uh, top of the hip bone or the the femur. Okay, so let's use let's use a blanket. I've got a survival blanket here. You can use a bed sheet. You can use a blanket. So I'm going to take the survival blanket, which we'll use in a minute for hypothermia treatment. Take it and fold it several times. Good for baked potatoes and cold Let's fold it in half. Twist. Fold it in half one more time. Okay. Lay down, Caden. Let's stick these up under here. Sam, go the other side. Okay, so we need to get this up under him. The best way to do this a lot of times is to have one person stand here and very gently grab his pockets and just pick up. So we're not like rolling and moving. We're just real easily picking up. Go ahead and slide it into place. Set it down. We want this wide to cradle it. We're gonna pull this. I'm gonna give that way. Pull, pull some good pressure, okay? And now we're gonna twist, okay? Significant, decent pressure. We're gonna take that and now we can zip tie this or we can tie this off somehow, but really tape, zip tie, something like that to hold this in place. And now we've improvised with either a sheet or even an emergency blanket. Our H here is for hypothermia and head injury. So head injury, he can become altered. We have that issue with weapons and stuff, right? He can become combative. There's not a lot we can do except recognize the head injury. Um, we can eventually know that, hey, he's got a head injury. It means he's probably got swelling. At some point, he's probably going to stop breathing or have abnormal breathing. We may have to help with ventilations and help breathing for him. The biggest thing we're going to do on the H is hypothermia treatment. 
So let's say you've been bleeding. You've lost a lot of blood. What happens when you get wet? You come out, you get cold, right? So he's wet from blood. He's lost blood, which your body gives off heat. It warms the blood. It acts like a radiator. It goes out to the rest of the body, warms the body, keeps everything. So if you have decreased circulation or your fingers get cold and have decreased circulation, it gets even colder, right? So we need to keep that blood going. We've just lost that blood that's acting as our radiator to keep that warm. We are now wet. So now we have a lot more cooling going on and we're losing more body heat because of how wet this patient is. So remove the wet clothes if possible, get those away. Keep this patient warm, get them off the ground, put them on something, put a blanket under them so they're not sitting directly on the ground because that contact is now gonna cause them to lose heat. When a patient gets cold, the blood does not work like it should. You have decreased clotting factors. Those clots do not stay like they should when the patient's cold. So if we can keep them warm, that body's gonna stay working um, like it should much longer than if they get cold. So don't avoid this. We avoid this a lot when we have patients. We see the blood, we treat the blood, and then we leave them. Let's keep them warm. We have emergency blankets. You saw how small that packed down in that little kit. They're cheap, they're like cents, right? You can get a bunch of these for really cheap. So keep them in, a, I wouldn't necessarily stick them in a, a I, if you have an IFAC, that's fine, stick them in. Um, if you have running an ankle kit, you may not stick the uh, entire blanket in there. It's one more thing to have to stick in there. I like to run the ankle kit really slim, so like chest seals, quick clot tourniquet, three things, maybe a chest dart. Um, but I'm eliminating MPA, blankets, that kind of stuff. But if you have a kit, a backpack med kit or something, they're cheap enough, throw them in there. This has no thermal properties to it, like insulation. It's just reflecting body heat. So it's reflecting that body heat back on them. So. If I have a blanket, I'm gonna put the blanket on and put this on top of that blanket. So now they have thermal properties, insulation properties from that blanket. And then we're gonna put this on top to reflect all that heat back in and try to keep more heat in. It also helps from wind because a blanket will have holes in it. This doesn't, so it helps keep a little bit of wind resistance and everything for that patient as well. If I have an active warming, which is like those hot hands, so an active warming blanket has that chemical in there. When exposed to the air, it gives off an exothermic reaction, gives off heat, so we can wrap them in a blanket put an active warming blanket on them, and then put this on top. This is gonna reflect that active warming heat back into the um, person, and also they have that blanket, so it's multi-layer. But at a minimum, if you have one of these, this is the cheap, easy, quick way to throw a blanket on them and help keep and maintain some of that heat. Does that make sense? So this is kind of the easy station, throw a blanket on them, but when we do drills later today, we've got some emergency blankets in there. Let's pull those out if we have someone that's in shock that has uh, lost significant blood. Let's try to keep them warm. Does that work? So in March, we're doing tourniquets and wound packing, right? We come to airway and we're doing airway positioning first, priority, airway positioning. We can also roll in recovery position. If we have an MPA, we can put an MPA down. But make sure you do some man manual manipulation first. Respirations, mainly chest seals. We can do a little bit of breathing with BVMs if we have that, but we're really looking at chest seals and penetrating trauma. Circulation, we're gonna be stabilizing and then we're gonna be downgrading tourniquets. So head injury, the biggest thing we're gonna do on the H is hypothermia treatment.